Hello, and welcome to Please Me. Last week, Rachel Lavin inspired us to love ourselves, whatever size we found ourselves in today. You are perfect right now, and loving yourself is the greatest gift you can give to you. This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Eve is a licensed physical therapist who is on a mission to destigmatize conversations about sex by turning the sheets into our classroom. Eve treats conditions related to sexual health. Please relax and enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to Please Me, the podcast that aims to destigmatize conversations about sex by turning the sheets into our classroom. Today, I have the honor to introduce a guest named Ann Bell, and she is a love, life, and sex coach, and she helps create the love life that you've been yearning to have. She is here to remind women that their needs matter and that they deserve an enjoyable and nourishing sex life. So without further ado, I am so excited to introduce Anne to our audience today. How are you, Anne? I'm well, Eve. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much. I am so excited to have you here and to find out how you got into Mm -hmm. uh, sex coaching in general and tell me about what led you up to this point in your life and your career thus far. Okay. Well, first, thank you for having me. I appreciate it very much. Um, I started my career as a massage therapist. I've been a massage therapist going on 27 years now. And I have the type of clientele that likes to talk. Um, so we get into all kinds of conversations and sex is always a big conversation. So I decided back in 2020 when the pandemic hit and I had to shutter my business that I would like to enhance my life coaching. And I went in the direction I became certified in sex, love and relationships. And, um, I've been doing fantastic ever since. I have to say that I have had many a conversation with massage therapists as I'm laying on the table and, you know, relationships often come up. Um, So I think that that's really interesting that you segue your massage career into, um, you know, health and sex coaching because, you know, they kind of, you are probably already doing that. You are already probably coaching people in a way, um, while they were on the table and trying to encourage them. Um, Always. Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And, and, um, and you know, you're, it's such a vulnerable place to be when you're getting a massage. And so you really kind of like relax and you let loose and your mind just starts to enjoy the pleasure that you're feeling. And it's very easy to, you know, go in that direction, um, mentally. Yes. And, you know, a lot of people don't have a safe space. This is the thing that I realize with massage therapy is they don't have a safe space where they can be vulnerable and that they can, you know, we're like the bartender and the hairdresser. So people want to tell you things because they don't really know you per se, even though I've had clients all 27 years with me. Um, and you form a type of a relationship. But I knew early on when a gentleman said that to me is like, I don't have a space where I can just tell about myself to anyone and just be myself. So it really was like, uh, you know, like an alarm bell going ding, ding, pay attention here because you're providing a sacred space. Now, what do I do with it? And I'm very pleased that that's one of the things my clients tell me all the time is they can talk to me about anything. And I really um, enjoy that aspect that I can provide that container for people to express and ask and get their needs met. I love that. I mean, I, I think that that is definitely a great adjunct to, you know, the massage space. And I know that a lot of massage therapists are doing that just, you know, naturally. Um, So I, you know, applaud you for getting that extra, you know, education so that you could really help your clients in that way as well and segue, you know, your business into something else. So um, I wanted to ask you, uh, because one of the questions that you had 
um, was finding your inner vixen. So I would love to get some tips and tricks on how myself and my listeners can find your the, our inner vixen. It's very interesting because how another reason why I got into this as a young person, I had a terrible sex life. You know, I am early 60s. We didn't talk about sex. It was not mentioned. You just kind of learn through osmosis. You always thought your men knew more than you about your own body. And I realized that was very untrue. So I had to start educating myself on what is good sex? That's the question to ask of yourself. What is good sex to you? And I started to explore. But the first thing I had to do was really go back and say to myself, well, what are my religious beliefs? What were my, what did I see my parents doing? What did I see in school? What did I see in society about sex? And what was my limiting beliefs about it? And I really had to pay attention and just answer those questions because that's where some of the roadblocks were. You know, religion says this message to me, don't have sex till you're married or, you know, whatever the messages were that I received as a young person, I had to rewire that, re, you know, reframe it all and go, but those aren't my beliefs. Those were beliefs installed in me from other people. So I had to back all of those out and go, well, what are my beliefs? What, what do I believe? And I believe I came to the conclusion that Sex is fun. Sex is normal. God gave women a clitoris for the pure pleasure. It's the only part of the body that is just for pleasure. Why Absolutely. would why would God do that if it wasn't just for that? So it none of it could be bad in my mind. I'm like, well, none of this is bad. Okay, great. Now let's learn how to do it. Now let's explore. Now let's find out and seek what your pleasure is. So I've, I'm a huge fan of self-pleasuring, masturbation. You have to know your own body. Absolutely. We can't rely on the men to know more than we do. You just can't because they don't. Some do. The majority don't. Correct. So you have to lead and guide and know what your turn on turn ons are so you can have better pleasure with your partner, whomever that is. But you must own it and then just allow yourself to build. You know, if you're coming from a repressed place about sex, more likely you're not going to run and jump into everything. You're going to take baby steps, take really baby steps and explore one new thing and see how that is. You know, maybe it's self-pleasuring. Maybe that's where you're going to start is with masturbation. Maybe it's going to be with your fingers. Maybe it's going to be with toys. Doesn't matter. But that's how you're going to find your inner vixen is to know what your turn ons are what how you receive pleasure and let's talk about penis and vagina sex oh my god that's not the only type of sex out there yes a normal penis and vagina sex is 5.7 minutes long women right. need a hell of a lot longer to get where they're going than 5.7 minutes foreplay foreplay you know, and I think that's where a lot of women suffer is because there's not enough foreplay. There's not enough warm up and they go straight to the penis and vagina. The guy is finished and she's still going, what the fuck? I, <laughs> <laughs> what, what just happened? Because I didn't feel anything. And that's why, you know, you're not broken. There's nothing wrong with you. 
It just takes a little education, exploration to learn how to orgasm, to learn about pleasure. And orgasm doesn't have to be the goal either. Take it all off the table. It's about fun. It's about pleasure. It's about being with your partner, laughing. Whatever happens, happens. Just allow the space, but don't be so goal-oriented that orgasm is the goal. I agree. I agree. Um, But there also is something called an orgasm gap, right? Where men are always getting their needs met and women aren't. And that's what you just actually described because it does take men five to seven minutes in coupled penetrative sex to reach climax. But for women, it takes 25 minutes or more. And, you know, women take at least 20 minutes to warm up. And, you know, you talk about erections. A man can't have penetrative sex without an erection, but a woman also shouldn't be having penetrative sex without a woman's heart on, right? Because our clitoris also gets Mm -hmm. engorged. So you have to stimulate the clitoris in order to get it engorged. And I love that you are encouraging people to masturbate and to touch themselves and to find out what works for them Because only in that way can you communicate that to your partner so that you will get your needs met. If you don't communicate that information, you will never get your needs met. So finding that inner vixen, you know, is first of all, first and foremost, figuring out what works, you know, for you physically, right? And then also, like you mentioned, throwing out all of those societal norms and expectations of us that are holding us back and making us feel ashamed because there really is no shame in sex. I mean, it is how we all got here, you know, on this planet. You cannot have a human being without people having sex first, you know? Why are we so ashamed? There is no shame in sex. Well, you know, we're ashamed because the patriarchy. I know why. (laughs) What I'm saying is... (laughs) I mean, there's so many, there's the patriarchy, there's religion, there's, you know, societal beliefs. I mean, there's so many things. There's body, you know, image, body image that is portrayed that people are supposed to look like, right? And if Mm -hmm. you don't fit that way, then you feel self-conscious and that can affect your, you know, the biggest sex organ in your body, which is your brain, Brain. right? So it's so important um, what you're talking about. Um, Right, because a lot of women don't know to go to those places. They don't know to say, oh, really? You know, they don't we don't always connect the dots that we're like this way because of our past. So when you're able to tell, you know, bring it forward for them, then they can start doing some work on themselves but the other thing is is not to have these conversations these are hard conversations to have for people they are they are don't have them in the bedroom have them outside the bedroom you know i would like to try something new you know i have a couple that i'm coaching and and they're in their 60s and i'm trying to talk to them about sex and she says well i i can't talk about this I says, well, can you talk about this with your partner at home? Well, I'll try, but probably not. I says, then it's not going to get better. No. If you're not going to be a little brave and have the conversation. And here I have courage. You are absolutely right. And it does take a lot of courage to get to the point where you can express what your feelings are and what your needs are and have your partner listen And I often say that if you have a partner that doesn't want to hear it, you may try to reconsider, you know, what's going on with this partner, because if they don't want to pleasure you, why are you in a relationship? I mean, I've even I've even been in, you know, had these hard conversations, been in the bedroom having sex. And I would say to my partner right there, right there, right there. And then he's off to the next shiny thing. And I'm like, where to go? Where did you go? You know, come listening is a key (laughs) element in, you know, having a good sexual experience. You have to listen to what your partner's doing, right? (laughs) I even struggle as a sex coach to get my partner like, hello, come back. You know, 
I'm telling you, I'm like right there and they're still off and running. So it is not an easy thing sometimes. I can relate because when you say right there, sometimes they get excited and then they speed up and you're like, no, don't speed up. Keep it exactly like what you were doing. (laughs) That's the spot and that's what you want to continue. So it's mm-hmm. funny, but yeah, I mean, and having these conversations and you're right, um, you know, pre-sex, it shouldn't be part of your, you know, your warm up, right? It should be, you know, it's good to, you know, make it part of your aftercare. And I definitely think that, you know, that's really important after having sex to, you know, talk to your partner about, you know, the highlights, what you liked, you know, right. what you'd like to repeat again, um, you know, to and encourage them you know, with the things that you really enjoy, because that's, they're going to remember that and they're going to do it again the next time. So aftercare, I think is a great time for communication. Um, But you're right, having these conversations pre-bedroom or wherever you're going to have sex um, is a great idea. And here's the other thing, if your partner is suggesting something that's very unusual to you, Mm -hmm. don't go, ooh. Don't go no. Don't go. I I I will. I tell women to really just try and keep a neutral face. You can say it in your mind, going, "Oh fuck no! Oh no no!" Uh, you can say it in your mind, but I want you to be become curious. Even if you're freaking in your mind, try to become curious and go, okay. That that's a little much for me, but tell me more about why you want to try that. Become curious and start asking questions. Because the first time someone says something to you sexually that is off the you can consider it off the wall. I could be consider it my normal. Mm-hmm. Become curious and then say, okay, I'm gonna think about this. I'm gonna get back to you. Let me have some time. Go do your research, come back, have another conversation. Okay, I've been thinking about this. Can we talk about it more? I'm becoming a little more curious. I'm not a hard no, but I'm not an all in either. So help me explain more to me. And you might have to have those conversations a couple of times on new and different things. So that that's when, awesome. when you shut your partner down, oh, hell no, they're not coming to you anymore. You have now just shamed them and they still have that need. And guess what? They're probably going to go elsewhere to get that need met. Or they're going to resent you. Yeah. Not being able to, you know, at least be open to providing, you know, some options. And when you think about sex, you know, sex is the our adult's playground this is where we play and who would only want to play monopoly their entire life you know what i mean it's nice to play other games too i like hopscotch i like jumping rope i like this i like that who only wants to play one way the whole entire time so it's so important to really you know try to figure out what those likes and dislikes are with your partner having those conversations and you know the sky is the limit There is so many things that you can experiment with sexually and, you know, encouraging people to really think about it as our adult playtime. What can we do to encourage more playfulness, more fun, more laughing? You know, all of that is part of the pleasure experience. And I think people get really stuck in their routine of sex because they're afraid to talk about it. They're afraid to bring something up because... You know, women have been very stigmatized. You know, we're supposed to act like whores in the bedroom, but we're supposed to be proper ladies in public, you know, and and you have this back and forth in your brain. Like, I want to try more, but I'm afraid to because I'm afraid of what my partner will think about me if I want to try this, this and this. So, and I think couples become monotonous, especially midlife. I think women hit perimenopause and menopause, their sex drive plummets because their hormones are all over the place. I think women are very busy. They're very busy doing everything else and they don't make any space to have sex. And you have to make 
time and space to have sex today. Otherwise, your to-do list is always going to take over. I can't, I have this. I can't, I have that. I can't. And you know what? I enjoy sex too much to be, to say, I don't want to because what? I have to wash the dishes. I have to do the laundry. I don't think your sex life is fulfilling if you want to have laundry over, do laundry and wash (laughs) dishes over having sex. I 100% agree with you. And I just recently had a client who, you know, I'm treating her, um, Anyway, I won't go into the details, but the point is that we started talking about her sex life and I said, so are you having more orgasm since we started treatment? And she said, well, my husband is. And I said, oh, well, that's good. And she said, you know, my my pelvic floor and my vaginal walls are stronger so I can squeeze it and make and make it get it get it over with faster is what she said. Mm-hmm. And I just drooped in my chair. And I was like, this is not the point. The point is that I want you to experience pleasure too. And she's like, I know, but our sex drives are different. And you know, and that's um, normal. That's completely so normal with couples. But then I, I encouraged her to have a conversation with her husband about it and say, listen, my headspace is not in it when your headspace is in it, you know? So let's figure out a time where our both of our headspaces can be in it. If you come to me in the middle of the day and I'm in the middle of doing laundry, washing dishes and whatever, you know, and I have these things to accomplish and you're interrupting that, my head space is not going to be in the moment with you. So let's check in in an hour and a half and we are going to have a full hour or whatever, however much time you schedule, but you have to make time for it. Because if you are not making time, you are never going to be able to explore. And and like you said, our to-do lists are way too long. And women don't realize that this is what they call breaks in accel- accelerators, where you have, if you have more breaks on, I have to do the laundry, I have to do this, I have to get the kids ready, then that's not a green light for you. You, you, and if you have, you want more accelerators, you know, like put your foot on the gas. Yes, I'm going to make time. Yes, I'm going to clear my head and start thinking about having sex with my husband. Yes, I'm going to do. And, and you literally have to transition that in your head. Absolutely. It's so important. And having those conversations are, is difficult, but it's so key to really having a good sex life. Because if you're not communicating, you're not going to enjoy it as much as you could. You might enjoy it, but you could enjoy it a lot more if you were having these conversations and communicating your wants and needs. Right? How do you en- encourage your clients to spice up their sex lives? Mm, you know, it, it depends. I'll throw out, um, you know, a few things to them. How, if they want to go into the kinky world, um, but just to let you know, like everybody's kinky. If you're spanking your partner, if you're tying them up, you're in the kinky world already. You know, people are like, ew. But I mean, I do know there's major extremes in kink, but if you're doing those little things, that's kinky. You're, you're in the kinky world already. That's, so that's, and, that's out of that's out of the box thinking when it comes to sex. You're right. Yes, and you know, there's polls that have been done that show that 45% of Americans consider themselves kinky, you know? Yeah. So so it's very, very common, you know? Yes. So, you know, you can, it, it could be as simple as having sex not in the bedroom. It could be public sex. I mean, just not even having the sex, but partially having and, and try and getting caught. It just depends on what it is that turns you on it could be lingerie it could be sexting it could be meeting your lover and acting like you don't know them and you know doing the old pickup thing there's so many different ways that you can re-engage with your partner and spice it up absolutely and you know having that conversation with somebody else and not your partner initially 
in a coaching session, I think is really a great way to try and tease out what are the things that really do interest you, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I, I think that that's great. And, um, and also practicing what you're going to say, because sometimes it's so scary that you don't want to even release the words from your mouth. You're afraid to say the words you're afraid that the, you know, your partner is going to judge you. And so really practicing that communication with somebody else, um, you know, in a sex coaching uh, situation, I think is so important if you have a lot of walls up, you know? Yeah. Um, you can also, with your partner, put on blindfolds and ask questions. Have one put the blindfold on, one ask questions, and that person with the blindfold on answers. So there's a little less vulnerability there. Um, so the person with the blindfold on can't see his partner, their partner, and they can answer the question truthfully, hopefully. Uh, maybe even back to back, sit with yourselves back to back in the beginning and talk to each other that way until you have that first or second conversation, then it gets so much easier. Yes. Breaking a seal, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, really starting that conversation. And I love the idea of cutting off visually, um, you know, one partner or even both partners by sitting back to back. Neither one can see each other or even both people putting on blindfolds. I mean, that way you're not actually looking at their face. You're just listening to what they say. It becomes a little bit less scary. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and then every so often you can peek out and say and see what, what their reaction is going to be, you know, and make it playful, too. You know, because sex talk, you know, having conversations about sex shouldn't be, you know, a, a business meeting. It should be fun. It should be exciting. It should be something that you're both enjoying and wanting to add value to. Mm -hmm. Um Definitely. Communication is just so, so important. How does self-love and sexual pleasure intertwine for you? You know, it's so interesting with self-love. We all struggle with that, you know, and I think especially as women, you know, body image and being kind to ourselves and comparing ourselves to other people. I think it's just, Honoring, self-love is honoring who you are. I think it's more than just, you know, going and having a massage, a nice lunch out, buying yourself flowers. I think it's really self-acceptance and, and being gracious and talking lovingly to yourself, even when you don't feel like it, even when we have the negative chatter going on in our head. It's to calm it down and... I just learned this technique that I thought was easier when we're having feelings um, because we do anything not to feel. But when you're having a strong feeling, welcome it. Just say to that feeling, you're welcome here. And watch how that just dissipates. And uh, I'm sorry, what was this part? The second part of the question I got off. <laughs> That's Okay. Um, how does self-love and sexual pleasure intertwine for you? So when you're able to be accepting of yourself and just tap into those desires and you're brave enough, you can try the new things. You can try all the different things that you want to try. And uh, even with just yourself first, you know, even having that... Um, private time, self-pleasuring. That's how you're really, you know, learning about yourself is in those moments. Absolutely. And, you know, masturbation is so important. I, I we talked about earlier to really fully understanding what really you like, because if you don't know what you like, you'll never be able to tell your partner what you'd like would like them to do, you know, and, um, you know, you mentioned earlier that sex comes in all varieties, like so many different forms. It's not just penetrative sex. You know, we're talking about um, foreplay and oral sex and, you know, touching massage. Massage can be part 
of the sexual experience by doing, you know, a vulva massage uh, and really getting that clitoris engorged. There's so many things that you can do. You can incorporate toys. You can incorporate um, swings and furniture and yeah. different spaces. And um, there's just so many things that you can do to really um, intertwine that, you know, sexual pleasure and 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 communicating that with your partner and telling them what you want to try is really so, so important. It's funny you mentioned massage. I just released, I, I took me a year long last year. I made a couple's massage video. Okay. On how, yes. How, yes, on how couples can massage each other, including the penis and the vulva. And I'm going to release it tomorrow. And it's on my website right now. Um, and it's a step-by-step guide on how to do it. And I have a manual, a 49 page manual that goes along with it with pictures, illustrations, and a step by step guide. And um, I'm very, very excited because it's taking both of my careers and match them. And I don't know, I taught this class without the penis and the vulva massage, but I would teach it to couples live and I watch couples transform before my eyes every single time. It was amazing to me. And I said to myself, you know, when the pandemic hit, I could no longer teach this class in public. Let me make it on video and I'm going to put in the peanuts and the vulva because people will be in the privacy of their own homes and people don't realize how much muscle tension these areas hold. You know, women from either childbirth, it could be sexual assault, could be just pelvic issues. There's a plethora of issues on massaging this area. And for men, the penis massage, men have a very hard time relaxing, especially during sex. They want to be doing something. And this is about their pleasure only. And also, it's a great way for women to understand the penis understand the balls um, to really just have fun with no outcome i mean they can ejaculate doesn't matter what they do but just to play have fun watch their person get turned on i talk about edging i you know i teach them all how to do that um it's just such a fun filled course and i'm just so thrilled to be offering it to people that they can really um, especially couples that have long term that have been together, they get bored, they're stale, they're stagnant. It's a great way for them to refresh all of that. It's great for newer couples that want to enhance their pleasure and and go from there. So it meets everybody's needs and it's really simple, easy and effective. It's a great way to explore a new partner or if you've never done it before, you know, a partner you've had for a long time, because really our nervous systems from head to toe are wired for pleasure. And so if you're only focused on, you know, the genitals, yes. you know, only the genitals are going to feel pleasure. And, you know, your whole entire body can feel pleasure and your whole entire body can feel sexual pleasure because your mind is connecting the dots, right? Yes. So if this shoulder, you know, touching this shoulder you know, and kissing on this shoulder turns you on, that's sexual pleasure. It doesn't have to be on your genitals. So really exploring the entire body, trying to get the entire nervous system tuned in is going to make sex so much more explosive. Yes. And I talk about erogenous zones and I talk about specific ones, but I talk about the whole body is an erogenous zone. Right. No, it's just not one specific areas. It could be anywhere, like you said, that your partner, you receive pleasure. So um, it's a very comprehensive course that I'm so thrilled that people and it's nominal. It's a nominal price that I'm charging. So I really wanted everybody to have access to it. That is really amazing. And um, I encourage my listeners to check that out, you know, when I'll get all your information in a little while. Thank you. Talk to me about physical intimacy and how you encourage people to be vulnerable. Mm. I think 
I the hit and here's the opposite. Women need to have emotional safety. They need to have safety in general to be vulnerable. And men look at sex. They like to have sex to be vulnerable. So sometimes we're clashing um, because we have different ways to feel vulnerable, especially in intimacy. Um, so emotional intimacy first for women and then physical in- intimacy for men. So how do you get women that the men are raring to go that, you know, they want to have sex to be intimate? So for the women, it really is having your partner provide that safety for you that 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 caring the protectiveness that you're looking for because if you don't have that from your partner you're more than likely not going to want to explore with them if you're not feeling safe with them um and open it's going to be a little bit harder for women i feel to um be vulnerable Yes, I agree. Women need that emotional safety first before they can be physically vulnerable. Mm -hmm. You know, men jump right into the physical and that's where they experience their vulnerability. Um, So I think that that's a a good, you know, thing to know about ourselves because we are different in that way, you know. And um, so, you know, but being very courageous in having these conversations, you know, building up that courage is going to make such a difference um, when it comes to, you know, having these conversations and putting yourself out there in a way that is very vulnerable. And it could just be, you know, talking initially and then segueing that into, you know, the space of physical vulnerability Mm -hmm. um, over time. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast and for, you know, being so honest about all of, you know, these things that you've been sharing with your clients. And I like to ask this question of all of my guests, and I think it's a really fun question and it gets us to talk about different um, positions and that sort of thing. So I would love to know what your favorite sex position is. I have a couple, actually. I like, I like, you know, and it'll depend on my partner, too um where they're at and and how it goes but i do like doggy style and i like being on top okay and you know two positions that i love as well because they offer the vulva to be completely open and so you can touch yourself or you can use a toy in both of those positions um very easily to, you know, try to bridge that orgasm gap for yourself. Because if you are just getting penetration, most women cannot orgasm that way. Uh, only, you know, five, three to five percent of women can orgasm for penetration alone. So women need clitoral or external vulva, stim- vulva stimulation in order to reach orgasm. So if you're not able to stimulate that area, you're not going to be able to reach orgasm very easily. So both positions allow you to touch yourself um, while you're getting penetrated. Mm-hmm. Yes. But I'm one of the luckier ones. I work, I've learned how to, you know, I can squirt. So I, I, those are the positions that help me the best. And, um, you know, and it depends, again, on my partner, how, how much in rhythm we are. Um you know, it is easier to orgasm for me in those penetrative orgasm, but and both. Yes. So it's a, a big playtime areas for me. That's great. And, you know, you are lucky because, like I said, only three to five per- percent of women can orgasm without vulvar stimulation, without touching themselves externally. So it is you are one of the lucky ones. You know, <laughs> I know I'm not one of the lucky ones and I have to stimulate externally while I'm getting penetrated in order to reach orgasm. And right. it's just the bottom line. Like it yes. just won't happen otherwise. So I know that about myself and I'm fine to say so, you know, because I want to have fun too. Yes. Know, so- and sometimes I don't want to do all that. You know, if it's, if it's not, if I don't have the mental capacity to stay in that space, then I will bring out the toys. Then I will do the clitoral 
um, orgasm that way. If I'm just not there um, space-wise, headspace-wise, and I want to orgasm, I will. I'll bring the toys out. And I don't I don't focus on how the orgasm is happening. Um, and sometimes if I'm just having a lot of pleasure and I feel good and my partner is finished, I'm good. You know, maybe I don't even have that mental space to go to orgasm, but I feel very nourished and fulfilled without it because my needs were met during the sex play. So it, it'll just depend where I'm at. And I think that's a good point. It's never going to be the same each time, which is why, you know, we're encouraging people to explore and try different things because what works one day may not work the next time, you know, and whether your mind is in it one day and your mind is not in it the next day and you need to bring a little extra help by introducing yeah. a vibrator or your hand or whatever that may be, you know, each time is going to be a different experience. So really go into it thinking that and um, and ex and thinking, keeping your mind open to exploration because all yeah. of it is really beautiful. And I will tell if my partner becomes too focused on the orgasm, and that will just get me off my game. I will out and out say, don't focus on the orgasm. I want to focus on the play. I, I need to get it off the table because you're going to fuck it up by keep pressuring me <laughs> to have an orgasm. So I'm like, don't, yes. don't yes. keep asking me uh, right away. Like, let me be. Just let me be. And it will happen. But stop asking me. That's how I'm. Wired. I am so I'm so 100 percent with you on that. When somebody, you know, says, did you come? Did no. you come? <laughs> no, that's like, it's like, just be quiet, you know, it is, it is. it's like, just stop pressuring me. Stop right. pressuring me to have this big orgasm. Right. Let me just have the type of sex I want. Right. Just enjoy every moment because every moment, if you're doing it right, should be pleasurable you know it should if you're having pain you know that's not that's not something you want to please you want to stop you want to add lube you want to stimulate more you want to you know mm -hmm. focus should, on listen there should to your be body. no pain during sex if you're having pain during sex there's something wrong and women don't understand especially women in midlife with genital urinary symptoms of perimenopause and married menopause um, there is, um, estrogen cream, which is very localized to the vagina and vulva, and that will help with UTIs. It'll help with, um, painful sex. It'll, you know, there's a plethora of benefits, um, for it because our vagina is a trophy, believe it or not. They used to call it senile vagina. Can you imagine? But senile? yes, they called it senile vagina because your parts a trophy. But with vaginal estrogen, it keeps them fresh and lubed up. So absolutely, you know, in menopause or perimenopause, a lot of times women lose sensitivity, mm -hmm. and yes. um, and and it's because there's less blood flow. Um, and not only do they lose sensitivity, but if there's less blood flow, there's also less lubrication internally. Um, so trying to get treatment for that is really key. And you mentioned one treatment, which is, you know, a, a vaginal cream that you can use, estrogen cream that you can use to increase sensitivity, dryness, and help with the other things that you mentioned. Um, as a licensed physical therapist, I help men and women with, with their sexual health. Um, and I um, work with erectile function, and I also treat decreased vaginal sensitivity and dryness with a treatment called acoustic wave therapy. And this is really the gold standard in increasing blood flow to the penis and vagina and vulva and clitoris. Um, and what it does is it unblocks the blockages that we have in our arteries, our blood vessels, um, and it allows the blockages to flow away and over a course of several treatments, um, it also helps increase capillary formation, which is going to increase uh, the blood flow to the area. And when you have blood flow, that's when the vaginal fluids can flow and you can get 
lubricated internally. But I always say that whether you are in menopause or you are 20 years old, adding lube to your sex practices oh, your, uh, is always, always, always. Lubrication is not just for people in menopause. People, no, it, everybody, every, everybody matter, can benefit. It doesn't matter how wet you get. Let's take the stigma out of this. It doesn't matter how wet you get. Use lube. I just had a woman who was having anal sex and she thought because she was so wet, she didn't have to use lube for anal. I And she was in so much pain. I'm like, oh, you poor thing. You have to use lube, especially in anal. Um, and it's insane what we think, the, the the stories we tell ourselves. But here's the other thing about perimenopause. You are, we're losing estrogen in the body. You have to put it back in. For me, hormone replacement therapy is the gold standard. Yeah, My yeah. life changed when I was able to get on HRT. That is a very good point. And listening to your body, understanding that it's mm -hmm. changing, and then seeking help for those changes. And this it is where I find that a lot of people and a lot of my clients come to me and, you know, I'm having that initial conversation with them and they're saying, oh, yes, I've been having this, you know, erectile problem for the last five years and, you know, I'm married, but it's like embarrassing because, you know, I can't really... I, c I can't really like, you know, get my wife, you know, to orgasm or even myself, I can't put it in, you know, it's all of this. Um, but my wife doesn't know I'm here, you know, yeah, and they yeah. are afraid to tell their partners. And they may go get the Viagra and don't tell their partner. So now she's getting slammed at home and she doesn't know why. I'm like, <laughs> you can... it's insane. <laughs> You come home with this giant erection. Where? What happened? You know, it's <laughs> night and day. You have to tell your partner you're on Viagra. I mean, yes, you're now going to powder. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's so insane to me what we do to each other sexually because we're afraid to talk about it. Our egos. I mean, it's absolutely insane how we cannot talk about sex. I agree. And that's what this is all about. This is exactly what this podcast is all about is destigmatizing conversations about sex so that we can all get our needs met. You know, there is no shame in seeking uh, help for sexual dysfunction. Right. And if you're experiencing sexual dysfunction, whether it be vaginal dryness, painful sex, um, you know, erectile dysfunction, uh, dryness, all of those things, they do. There are treatments out there. For, and here, for you're exactly 100%. But here's the thing that's happened in the last 20 years is doctors have not been educated about any of it. They've not been educated because the Women's Health Initiative came out in 2002, took hormone replacement therapy off the market. Before that, the argument is it was either the number one or number four prescription written in the United States. Wow. Okay. Yes. So this study came out full of misinformation. They got starting to debunk. It's been debunked. But now doctors for 20 years have not been educated. So I had to go to several doctors and my famous statement, I educated myself about this. Doctor, that's no longer true. Doctor, that's no, I, my gyno wouldn't write because I have a sister with breast cancer. No longer true. It will not increase your risk of breast cancer. In fact, it'll give you a 23% decrease. And if you do get it, it's a 40% mortality decrease. So, I mean, estrogen has so many benefits, um, but you have to advocate for yourself. I went to a gynecologist about squirting. She was shamed me because she didn't want to talk about it and, or she didn't know, want to know about it. They want to talk about the functioning body parts. They don't want to talk about the sexual parts. So right. keep what advocating you for yourself. Always advocate for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, speak to your medical professionals, but if you don't find the answers that you're looking for, mm -hmm. keep looking because there are, you know, doctors out there that are comfortable with having these conversations. Yes. 
And if you don't have a doctor, especially your gynecologist, right? That, They're the worst. Know, yeah, I know. And they all they want to talk about is, you know, popping out babies. And, you know, once you're done with that part of your life, you don't want to talk about that anymore. You, right. <laughs> you want to start, you want to start having pleasure. You're like my, you know, in my mind, my baby days are over. Where is my time? I also have a free menopause resource on my website to get you started with doctors, how to Gen X doctors that are leading the movement um, on how to get yourself educated about hormone replacement therapy. Because I, in July, was last July, was diagnosed with a blood clotting disorder. And my hematologist was like, no, no, no. And I said, well, I'm going to do it anyways, because my gynecologist that I found online through telehealth, through alloy.com, said to me, "You're it's valid. I'll, the science is behind you. HRT is not going to increase your blood clotting factor any more than it already is. And I said to my new hematologist, I said to him, look, I've been on it for two months. I feel great. I, I have my old self again. I was like losing the will to live. I said to him, if my body's going to make spontaneous blood clots, I'm going to die happy doing it. And he said to me, <laughs> that's all I need to know about you as a patient. I uh, He read the studies I brought him. And he says, I approve you being on this. You know, we and but you have to find the right doctor. That was my second hematologist. I'm on my third gynecologist. I don't care if you're not going to be in my wheelhouse of thinking and treatment, then you can't be on my team. And that's Absolutely. how I feel about this, because as long as the benefits outweigh the risks about hormone replacement therapy, you can be on it the rest of your life. And I love that you mentioned a team, right? Because this is your medical team. These are the people that you're choosing to take care of your health and to talk to about your health. And if they're uncomfortable, you know, or yeah. they're or they don't know the latest research, you know, and you're having to prove, you know, one thing after another to them. Mm -hmm. And I love that there's some doctors that will take those studies and will read them and will, you know, have the conversation with you. But the some are so close minded yes. and, you know, are so on to the next patient already that they don't even want to spare the time to have these conversations with you. And that's when you say next, because, yeah. you know, just like a bad relationship <laughs> you yeah. know, can, can be like, you know, hit the road. So can any doctors, you know, that you go see that, you know, is not on your team and trying to get you to the goal that you're trying to reach. And it's your goal, your body. So you have this blood clotting disorder. So now you've got to figure out different ways of doing things. And if they're not on the same team as you and they say no across the board, when you, they know that it's something that you really want to do because it's making you feel better, you know, why would you continue seeing that doctor? Right. And I called him up and I left him a message, canceled my appointment. And I said, thank you for the care. But I need a doctor who is interested in shared decision making. He wouldn't even call my gynecologist. He wouldn't even talk to her about it. He wouldn't even have a conversation. And I'm like, oh, I'm not doing this. I'm not moving on. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's what you have to do. You have to knock down a few doors, but you will get your answer. You will find if you know it's for you. Don't take no for an answer. And it was the best decision I ever made. I can't tell you in two months time, I feel like my old self again. My sex drive is back. I feel juicy. I feel happier. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And I'm so happy I did not listen to them. So all the all those ladies out there going through perimenopause and the menopause, menopause mm -hmm. you know, really take note of this conversation because you can feel good in your own skin. You don't have to be miserable. You don't have to be a dried up, you know, you <laughs> raisin. You can be, you know, juicy and yes. um, vibrant. You're going to spend Absolutely. A, a third of your life is going to be spent in menopause. How do you want to live it? How do you want to live it? I love that statistic. I'm crazy about statistics because it really brings home the point 
a third of your life is going to be spent. That is a long time yes. to be in menopause. So how are you going to really allow pleasure to be part, a big part of your life during that time? And, you know, the only way is to seek treatment because our bodies start to fail us, right? And we need to like help them along the way. 4% of women are on, they they call it menopause treatment or I'm old school, hormone replacement therapy. You'll hear both. 4% of women in menopause are on hormone replacement therapy. That's where insane. before 2002, it was the number one, number four prescription written. Wow. I, I mean, that's a huge change. And huge. a lot of people are suffering because of that. Suffering. Women, hip fractures, heart disease, uh, colon cancer. I mean, all these are reduction. You will get reductions on HRT. You know, and it's not only that, it's nutrition, it's sleep, it's stress reduction, it's exercise and HRT. What of supplements? You put them all together, ding, ding, ding. Yep, you have to take care of your entire body. You know, yes. you just can't pop a pill or whatever it right. may be. You have, have to take care of, absolutely, getting the right amount of sleep, drinking enough water, all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, but seeking help medically when you need it is so key. Go. So please go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So I want to make sure that my listeners can find you. So please let us know where they can find you. You can find me. My website is aconfidentialconversation.com and everything's listed there. I have free resources. All my podcasts are on there. Um, you'll be able to get the massage course on there. Please, you know, seek it out because I think it's something so fantastic because I made it. But no, I think it's really, really <laughs> good because I, I've seen the results of it. So please indulge yourself. And, you know, you've had a very long career and, you know, you've said that you've had clients that you've had for 27 know, years, you know, 27 years, which is a testament to the fact that you are very good at what you do. And so teaching those skills to others and in a way that is going to enhance their pleasure. I mean, how much more beautiful can, can, can that get, you know, so go out and seek, you know, go out and seek that course and, and check out her website. Well, I thank you so much, Anne, for coming on the show today. And I appreciate all of the information that you provided. So thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure, Eve. Definitely. Until next time. Visit pleaseme.online to reach Eve or for more information on products to increase blood flow and overall health. For her curated list of her favorite toys, and for swag that shows that you are a big fan. Please consider supporting the show.